All right, all right. Welcome, welcome to uh, another edition, another special edition of the Ujima Hour. I am your host, uh, Michael Tekken Strode, uh, founding coordinator of the Colonet Collaborative, Chicago's only time based uh, skills and service exchange, otherwise known as a time bank, and a member of the Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, an intentional gathering space where we explore, enrich, and exchange. Uh, insights on the history uh, and contemporary practice of cooperative economic development in black communities. Um, so uh, welcome to another edition of the Ujima Hour. The Ujima, Ujima Hour is your, um, your curious exploration of the black social and solidarity economy through intimate and formal conversation. Uh, but we don't do that work through economists. We don't do that work through uh, specifically through specialists, through uh, folks who have a sort of technical view of the economy. Uh, we do that, that work through folks who have uh, an organizer's view, an activist view, um, a, a creative uh, approach, a cultural approach. Um, we do that work through um, conversations with people uh, who are living inside of economies. Uh, we do that work by engaging in intimate and informal conversations about the stories that inform their work and about how they think about the interaction and the intersection of their work with uh, the economy, as it were, you know, um, that's sort of with these sort of scare quotes in there. Um, because ultimately, uh, we don't think that the economy is, an, is a specialist game. It is not. Um, the economy is a practitioner's game. Um, we all uh, have um, a specific um, way that we engage with, you know, with pursuing the resources that we need to make meaningful lives for ourselves, as well as, uh, you know, with, with the way that we engage with other people in terms of sharing our resources. And all of those things mean that we have a, a specific experiential, experimental view of the economy um, that is generally more valuable than anything that um, someone with a more technical approach uh, can offer. Uh, so here on the Ujima Hour, um, that is what we are engaged in. We are engaged in that exploration of that uh, of the of the Black social and solidarity economy, the way that Black communities are engaged in building economies um, that are sustainable, um, that are durable, that are resilient, um, that actually meet the social, cultural, uh, and economic needs of the people that are in these these communities, um, and and not necessarily. Um, extract wealth from those communities uh, to go and, and, and rest in other places. Um, so, so that is what we are here doing on the Ujima Hour. Um, that, is, that is why we have these monthly conversations uh, and speak to, to guests who are, are working on issues of, of concern. Um, and in these special edition episodes, we've had an opportunity to uh, close out the end of the year reflecting on various principles of Kwanzaa uh, in relation to these co this concept of a social and solidarity economy and in relation to, to, um, to some of the work that our, our guests are doing. Uh, so this has been a, a very, hopefully a valuable space to both revisit conversations um, that we had earlier in the year. So this one is uh, our guest from April. Um, and you know, and, and also to have new conversations. So uh, I, I hope that you had an opportunity to check out that that bright and brilliant conversation uh, between uh, Deidre Somerville and Yavit Holtz uh, yesterday, uh, really talking about you know Isusu and, and money sharing, money pooling, um, cultural practice um, within you know African diasporic communities throughout the world. Um, you know, because uh, that was a, a wonderful dialogue and exchange in which I was able to just drop out, right? I could just, I stepped out of that conversation because they had such a rich electric, um, you know, engagement happening uh, between one another in that space. And, and, you know, I never want to interfere with that. You know, um, the goal of facilitating conversation is to make sure that you seed only, you know, um, as much as, as the conversation requires and then let folks, you know, uh, tell their stories. And that, that was beautiful that, how that happened yesterday. Um, so if you didn't see that conversation, please uh, check out the Colonet Collaborative Facebook page. Um, all of the conversations are archived there. They will eventually move to, um, uh, to YouTube and to Internet Archive. Um, but, you know, in the interim, um, those conversations are all broadcast live and, and available there on the Facebook page of the Colonet Collaborative um, for you to, to view and for you to check out. Um, as are all of the other conversations that we've had throughout the year um, on the Ujima Hour, um, you know, just revisiting sort of our, our guest roster um, throughout the year. Um, you know, earlier in the year, we talked to Joan Fadairo of Co-op for Lib. Um, we had uh, Damon Williams from Let Us Breathe, you know, back in March. Uh, of course, Meta, you know, um, in April, and we're revisiting now. Um, Allende Jean-Baptiste um, back in 
in May, uh, Lasaya Wade in, in uh, June, and then we had a recent an update conversation with Lasaya earlier this week. Um, Elizabeth Carter in, in July, um, Cooperative Enterprise Legal Center, Gregory Jackson, uh, Sustainable Economies Law Center and Repaired Nations, uh, Bianca Shaw and uh, Angelique De La Cruz um, of Tribe Co-Create um, in the Bronx, um, Eric Jackson in, in October, um, Black Yield Institute, Malikia Johnson, uh, Take Care of Each Other World Tour in November, and finally Alita Torre um, in uh, December. So that, that's been a, a really full year of conversations um, that we've had an opportunity to have. And we're looking forward to, to this year, you know, because already on the lineup, you know, um, in, in January, we'll be talking to Erica Allen, Urban Growers Collective. We'll be uh, touching base with Caitlin Johnson in February, Black Roots Alliance. Um, Latier Pyphus is coming back from Womanist Working Collective in April to give us an update on their projects. Um, Dominique Duval Duval Diop, um, Liz Drame, and Laura Porterfield of Deroot Consulting Cooperative. Um, check in with us in May. Uh, Brandon Durham, Feed the People Shy in June. Um, Taryn Randall, Get Getting Grown Collective over there in Inglewood in July. Um, and then in September, we've got scheduled Hafide Akwe of um, People's Hub. So, you know, there's, there's a few interesting um, threads, a few interesting conversations. I'm looking forward to checking out four more slots um, that we have um, for guests, you know, that we'll be, we'll be checking in with um, in 2021. Uh, so, you know, um, you, 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 you guests out there who are looking at this broadcast, you should have received your invitation. Check that out. Um, look at the calendar, see what you have available and open or are interested in, in, in um, opening up. Um, and we'll we'll get you on. We'll we'll check into this broadcast. Um, so today, um, of course, we are here on the fifth day of Kwanzaa Nia purpose, um, reflected reflected in the Kwanzaa principles as to make our collective vocation the building and developing of our community in order to restore our people to their traditional greatness. Um, and I offer again another one of those Kwanzaa reflections from uh, 2013. Uh, the 33-year-old me speaking to the 40-year-old me um, and, and, you know, and oftentimes having, you know, minor disagreements, major disagreements, who knows, um, but ultimately, you know, there's an opportunity to reflect on what was then, what is now, and what we learned from that. Eschewing the fatalism often attached to the term, we now consider purpose in accord with the practice of, with a practice informing numerous conversations at the close of the year, resolutions. For what is a purpose? But that quality of resoluteness which compels one forward in the accomplishment of a desired goal. Too often, purpose like unity assumes a mystic and ethereal quality attaching itself to ambiguous questions on the nature of life and reality. But purpose is merely an expression of self-determination. The application of your skill set toward identifying and resolving issues within the community, each decision leading to an evolved purpose and responsibility for those efforts which fit your developmental agenda. There is no purpose which you will truly own that can be designated by someone other than yourself. You must properly analyze the needs of the community and select for yourself those roles which fit your particular attributes. Uh, as the arbiter of your own purpose, interaction with the collective should provide cues for, to evolving communal needs and move you to acquire the skills needed for that purpose. Purpose is no static quantity, but the marriage of flexibility, forecasting and adaptation. It is a reflection of current circumstances even as you seek to transform these conditions which involves an ongoing critical reassessment of, in, of any errors in your previous analysis. Um, there is some reflection on an image you know that was designed by Freedom Artistic Design so I'll skip over that. Um, thereby so in, in, and to the close uh, thereby purpose will determine with whom you uh, determine with whom you assemble and move you to seek out mentorship and partnership opportunities with those whom can augment your toolkit making you ever more useful in expanding and acting in accord with your selective your self-selected purpose um, so ultimately you know this was a bit of a choose your own adventure um, you know expression I, I look back on my 33 33 year old self and I, I say that you know he probably could have said that in fewer words um, as I would now. Um, and, and so ultimately, uh, I think, you know, what, uh, what he was saying was, was that um, we have an opportunity to engage in self-determination, um, engage in, in communal self-determination, right? You know, so there's that individual self-determination, there's that communal self-determination. And through that path, through that, that space, chart out a purpose, um, chart out a collective vocation that we, we think we can commit ourselves to. And hopefully you have some resolutions for what that collective vocation is for you this year. 
Um, I will continue on, you know, with um, the, the work of the Ushama Hour, the, the work of the Colonet Collaborative, the work of Cooperation for Liberation Study and Working Group, uh, because I feel rooted in my purpose that, you know, understanding and, and helping others to connect around this, uh, these co cooperative histories um, uh, within black communities and with, within black cultural uh, history um, are things that will allow us to extract, to excavate them from the past, bring them into the present, and build a better future. So I hope you find some purpose in that. Um, and, and with that, you know, um, with that, that brief monologue, we want to go ahead and bring in our guest. Um, again, you know, Maida McNeil uh, joined us back in April to talk about uh, some of the work that was happening within Honeypot Performance, some of the work happening within the Fifth City Project. Uh, and, and, you know, and we are now rejoined so that we can reconnect on some of the questions that were lost to uh, the, the, the technical challenges of the time. Um, and, and, you know, there, that, that's an opportunity. It's a learning opportunity. So we have learned, you know, from that, that, uh, those technical challenges of the past, and we come to address them now. But we'll revisit some of those questions. We'll check on some, some things that are current with the project uh, that she's working on now. And, um, and also, you know, maybe dive into a few other layers that we didn't get a chance to touch base on in the previous interview. Uh, so with that, I want to go ahead and open the floor. Um, welcome to the broadcast, Mita. Hi, Michael. Hi. How you doing? <laughs> oh, doing, doing excellent on my end. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm good. Enjoying this end of the year break. Wonderful, wonderful. So um, in the previous um, broadcast, we started with a question that was around um, you giving us your background, your bio, your story. Um, you know, there was a, a really expansive dialogue. You know, I could see the expressions, but the audio was just not launching. So, you know, uh, why don't you go ahead and offer background bio story now? Um, we'll just so we can get that for posterity. Um, OK, cool. So. Uh my background. Um, I am from Chicago, um, family um, roots on the west side in the Fifth City community um, off of Jackson and Spalding. And um, yeah, I'm an uh, artist, educator, scholar, researcher, administrator, wear many hats, but all of them are pointing towards um, the support of uh, Chicago's arts ecosystem. And within that, kind of thinking about um, the uh, folks' access to the arts and creativity, and that that is really, I think of it as an integral, um, when we think about quality of life issues and like what is the holistic, like what do people need? that creativity is part of that and uh, access to pathways to be creative, to learn creative skill sets, to think with the creative mindset are also really important. Um, and so I think all of my life's work, it, whether in education or as an artist producer myself, or through some of the kind of collective archive projects that um, uh, my company, Honey Pop Performance, has, has been making that it's, you know, it's really about thinking about the arts as a, a portal and platform to knowledge making and often um, as a way of thinking about collective and um, consensus building. Uh, how do we make choices together and decide together in a way where uh, folks feel like they're heard, um, that they have choices open to them um, and that we can get past kind of disagreements and challenges within that. Like we can create, that the arts are actually a, a mechanism that can help uh, diffuse some of those challenges and help us think creatively about how we can make decisions together. So I think, um, I'm, let me, I'm gonna, then I'm gonna back up. So I think what got me to all of this was um, just as a kid, um, I was always, drawn to making. I started with poetry and writing um, and then found my way to dance uh, through the parks uh, and then went on to uh, train with Joseph Holmes uh, Dance Theater um, when I was in um, you know, uh, junior high and high school. 
um, and then continued um, with college and grad school to uh, follow dance as a form of knowledge making, as a choreographer, dance maker, and then it has, has kind of expanded to being in general like a performance maker. So movement is one, is part of um, a number of uh, creative ways to, to make things. Um, and then I followed that into uh, work, uh, into uh, a PhD in performance studies at Northwestern here. So uh, I feel like I've, I've been taken out of Chicago, and brought back, taken out, brought, brought, brought back. Um, but like, I'm always, always brought back here. And I, I feel like the last time I came back, I was like, you know, this is where my work is. Uh, I'm connected to this place um, and I wanna see it thrive. So, um, you know, I think in some ways my art making is just about being, that's my contribution as a resident here um, who loves Chicago. Um, what else might I say about my background? I think um, the work, uh, you know, um, as I think about like my education and the research and the passive inquiry that I was on, part of that also was I've had a long relationship with um, Trinidad um, and did a lot of um, ethnographic research working with dance companies there. And um, you know, it exposed me to another part of the African diaspora, made me think about the expansion of blackness and how it presents, uh, it, you know, in people and in traditions and uh, cultural ways of making um, and like taking and learning from that. Um, and I think that influence, also influences a lot of what I do now um, and how I think about uh, performance and knowledge as knowledge. Um, and then I would say the work with Honeypot, that has been kind of like a 20 year long relationship with a group of black women that grew into uh, a creative organization that was also like really organic, started with friends who just wanted to make together and tell stories together, and then has grown into this, this approach, this uh, way of thinking about performance as a portal and platform. Um, and we're still going strong in the past couple of years. We have uh, become a nonprofit. And so have, have thought about like, you know, what are the, the um, pots or trajectories of our work? So, you know, we are, we make performance, we make performance works, um, but we also um, have a longstanding project, archiving project called the Chicago Black Social Culture Map and are now, uh, because I think so many of us within the group have educator roots or some part of us is is doing that work, we have been um, on this kind of journey to kind of uh, turn our work into a method, create a curriculum, um, and to see where that, that will take us um, in that work. So I think that's a good summary of background from a bunch of different places. Absolutely. Um, so one one thing I want to touch on, um, you've talked about stories in, in some previous conversations we've had and just, you know, stories kind of permeate through other areas of your work. And there's a, a question there or a conversation that I was having recently about the, I was speaking with someone about the, the sort of maybe lack of certain institutions within black communities, but then I was also kind of highlighting that the oral culture and orality is its own sort of institution. So I'm just wondering, you know, what you might think about sort of the, the use of both stories and the oral archive as a type of institution building. Yeah, I think that speaks back to what I was saying, you know, like, um, my uh, connection with Trinidad and that kind of opening my eyes to other parts of the African diaspora. Part of that is like also being um, more acutely aware of, um, I, I, I guess like I don't believe in high, low, you know, um, or um, vertical hierarchies of like knowledge production and that knowledge comes from everywhere. And it's it's in stories, it's in the, you know, uh, the the lessons you learn from your grandmother, grandfather, aunts and uncles, cousins, whatever, you know, in the family home. 
is um, in, you know, stories and things, knowledge that get taught on the block. Um, you know, it comes in, it, it comes in all sorts of places. And I think um, queuing into like that range and depth across uh, storytelling or the body and movement or image making or whatever um, across the African diaspora has made me really think, you know, just think about how, how strong that is, wherever you are in the diaspora, that's part of how I think black folks think about knowledge making, that it's not just in the written, it's in the body and it's in, you know, the way we talk to each other and, you know, all of that. Um, so I think that's very much, you know, integrated into how we think about how we make work with Honey Pot performance. Um, and then I'll say this too, in terms of the way we make our works, like storytelling is an integral part of that first component. So whenever we start a new work, there's always um, what we call like a, a community process that um, is usually about six months long and we design some set of experiences in which we bring different kinds of folks together um, to kind of explore that topic. And there will always be stories that are uh, part uh, of that process uh, because that's, you know, that's one of the um, main ways that I think we carry our knowledge in our, in these containers, <laughs> you know, um, and that uh, opportunity to express that with other folks um, not only get you to, to think about the value of what what you know and how you know it, but also like by being in conversation with other folks, I think it like sparks other things, you know, uh, that you might not have been thinking about or challenges you to stretch and think about what you thought you knew in a different way. And all of that is through this um, mechanism or vehicle of storytelling, of expression, with other people, you know, uh, in, in collectivity. So um, to that, that point around, you know, um, the community process and that connects to an earlier question that we talked about as far as the community as, as its own archive, um, maybe talk about the community as archive, but also talk about, you know, what you, what you have learned about facilitation. Uh, one of the things that I've shared, you know, recently um, is that facilitation for me now feels like the glue of democratic spaces, you know, um, it's required that everyone understand something about facilitation, but then also, you know, that we lean into better and better facil facilitative processes. So just, you know, what, what have you kind of drawn on in terms of facilitation in that community process building that you, you've dealt with? That's my jam. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, I mean, there's an art to convening people, right? And to trying to create space for them to feel vulnerable, vulnerable enough to share together or to, you know, take some risk together. And you have to, you have to set the stage for that to happen. So I think, you know, we've come to um, really think about like the invitation, first off, like, you know, how do we invite folks in, right? And, um, what works for one one person or one set of folks, one community might not work for another. So you've got to kind of stretch and, and think about that, right? So, you know, um, I, yeah. And then I think um, in terms of when we're creating and designing experiences like that support the launch into the investigation of whatever topic we're working on, whether it's like house music or black women's knowledge or um, the, you know, uh, impact of the economy on our bodies and souls and, you know, everything. Um, we're thinking about like designing unique experiences that get folks to, whether it's like prompts or something that you're making um, with, with someone else um or uh you know for like the the um one of our projects that was around house music and kind of exploring um the impact of like the great migration on uh 
like what our black social traditions have been, you know, as they transplanted themselves and adapted over the decades, you know, that was just like big, uh, big maps that we used, um, post-it notes uh, and invited people to come together and kind of like all map that together, right? Under some kind of social setting, uh, but then also create its individual space. Like there's that collective space which has a dance floor and so you could convene that way or you could convene in these acts of like putting up the post-its of the places you've been or that you know in your family's kind of um or friend circles or whatever uh or community lore of like you know where where the spots were that you also had spaces where you could you know, take for yourself as an individual to kind of fill out a map that had some prompts and some visuals for you to think about like well what's my own what's my own journey right? And uh, into this music or into Black social traditions and how do I, you know, think about that. And so I think we, like, all of that is design, right? And that's a part, I think that's, you know, there's invitation and there's, like, design um, in terms of, like, facilitation and thinking about these various, like, how do I also create these ways that are going to spark thought and um, a further jump into a topic uh, and and exploration and these uh, ways to kind of create um, a space for people to find each other and um, find each other in conversation and making together, right? Uh, And then there's adaptation. And then, you know, so like you make all, you do all of that, you plan all of that and you plan and you practice it well so that you can go in and be like, I know the map I have, I, I have that embodied, right? when I come into that space to facilitate connection of this group. But there's always going to be the X factor of who are these personalities in the room together? Who are these energies who are sharing space and time for, for this particular event? And how do we adjust in the moment for whatever might happen? If a conversation goes off the track that we've set and goes down another road, like how do we breathe? you know, use that map as a guideline, but then say, okay, I'm going to let this continue to go into this other space because that's where the energies that are in this space sharing together right now want to go, right? And there's something to learn from that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then I think there was one other I wanted to add to that. So uh, invitation, design, adaptation, um, and then I, I think document documentation, right? Because I think that there are things that when you're convening in the moment, having to like, you know, you have the plan um, and the guide and the map that you're following, you adapt to whatever happens actually in that moment. Um, so there's something, there are things that you're gonna miss, right? And so I think like what we've learned over time is having, designing these kinds of experiences where we have data that we can then take with us after to be able to reflect on it um whether that's like again like you know maps with sticky notes on it that we're going to be able to look at or um things that people have written prompts they've responded to uh and shared with us or images they've made that we can then take that and kind of analyze that further um in the studio when we're going to make you know the performance uh work um or whatever we started to kind of really think about like what what are we contributing to the knowledge register out of the work that will stay with us beyond the performance so that's brought us into the realm of kind of making digital you know websites or um creating books um and i think when we have that documentation it just creates something so rich um that uh you're learning years after you finish that process, you finish that work, right? And you got all of that richness that people shared with you um, that you can then analyze and turn, in, turn into something else. Um, yeah, so I, invitation, design, adaptation, and, and documentation, I, I would say are all really important parts of uh, the facilitation process that and those are things we've learned over time in the act of doing these works over the years. 
And so then um, let's maybe connect that to, you know, one of these other sort of, you know, previous questions around um, how that process that you, you described there um, connects to this, this idea of cultural stewardship and what you do with, uh, with young people in the parks and in the various park programs. Um, you know, how does sort of, you know, what the skill set developed in this, this space flow into that work? Mm. Yes. Um, so I, I think that in terms of this idea of the collectivity, right, um, I'm all for the idea uh, of uh, giving, giving folks what they need to, like, do the things themselves uh, or learning together so that we then we all come out of it knowing how to do the things you know and i and i feel like the um the work with honeypot over the years these kind of these processes right um of exploring some kind of question about you know the, our the conditions of our lived lives as uh black folks as chicagoans as uh folks a part of the of the diaspora has kind of um bled into the work i do with the parks um and that work being focused more on um in a citywide context you know how do we capture the richness of all of our um cities communities uh which are in many ways different you know uh, we share a city but um you know our stories are not all the same um and then our access to resources are not all the same so i think you know like within the parks it's it's kind of created this space where the work is feels like it has this uh really rich potential civic impact right um and that we are uh one trying to recognize give visibility represent uh the richness of all these neighborhoods but to address where uh the resources are not there um and thinking about like how do we how do we create space for them um and pathways for folks to get those resources, whether that is um, learning the systems of the parks, which, you know, it's a big behemoth system um, with a lot of departments and folks. And, you know, so like, can we, can my department, my unit create um, pathways for people to understand like what you, you know, the steps to do something so that you can get it done quicker and you can bypass all of the, like, how do I do this? Who do I talk to? And we just kind of give you, he, here's the way that, to do it, you know? Um, I think that's that's been an important thing, uh, but then also trying to kind of stretch the parts um, and that behemoth, often inefficient system to to be able to better address what people want and need right and for them to to kind of create in the same ways that with honeypot we are you know kind of creating these environments facilitated environments and designed experiences for people to um kind of you know share stories thinking about like how do we within the parks and the arts and culture unit and the cultural arts and nature department how do we design um experiences or ways to convene so that people can lift up their voices together to say here are the things we want in our community um and to maybe even bring and for us so for, for my team to kind of offer whatever we can right, in terms of immediate resources to make things happen, to make a program or event happen uh, more quickly, but then also teach them how the system works and then to problem solve with them to think about, well, if we don't have, if we don't have the resources, if the parks don't necessarily have the resources, if you don't necessarily have the resources within yourselves, how do we find them outside? How, you know, how do we problem solve together to find 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 the things that you're asking for, right? And to also um, 
I think, learn to think about that things might not be immediate, right? That we all have to exercise some patience, um, even when we shouldn't have to, um, in terms of, I think, you know, like going back to what I was saying about communities, um, not, some communities not having the access, right, to resources, right? Um, but learning, like, well, this is how the system works, so um, let's find these ways to build plans together so that we can get you what you're asking for, right? And going back to this patience piece, like that part part of that um, learning is like the patience of working through all of the layers of that system if it hasn't changed yet, right? And knowing that even though we're patiently moving through that system to get the things that people are asking for, we're also at some point or in, in some ways trying to push the system to shift and change, right? Um, and I think we see flashes of that, like in the past year, you could see it in, um, you know, what was a, had been going on for years, like the shift of trying to shift Douglas Park, you know, in the name of Stephen A. Douglas as a slaveholder and, you know, shift that name to um, Frederick Douglas and Anna Douglas's wife. Um, like that was, that was a process that took multiple years, right? You know what I mean? Even though, um, the young folks at the, at that high school, at that uh, elementary school, um, were working with, you know, some of the, the park staff to kind of understand the system and how to move through it, like how to you know, who they needed to talk to and taking those steps that it still took multiple years, right, for that to happen. Uh, but then once the change happened, I feel like it's creating now, it's opened a door uh, or to, um, for that kind of transition to happen more quickly. So I think, you know, we're going to see more parks that have questionable, um, you know, names uh, and, and histories behind them that, you know, that there'll be more communities that make that push. And now there's a precedent um, because another community went through that multi-year push and struggle to move through the system to change it, right? And that's a, a change that will now kind of stick in this system, right? Um, and so I think a lot of, I, I, I think a lot about, you know, that the, that the work with Honeypot has taught me to invest in that kind of process, right? even when we want to just burn down the whole damn thing, you know, <laughs> that it doesn't, it often doesn't work that way. And we've got to find other ways to um, push through a process together to make the, the change happen. Um, yeah, that's a good transit transitional note in terms of communal self-determination to uh, really helping people ground in fifth city project. Um, or Fifth City Revisited, rather. Um, so we, we did have a more extensive conversation. That part of the conversation did get captured on the footage um, previously. But do you want to just give folks, you know, uh, uh, a way in, a door, an inroad into the Fifth City Revisited project? Um, where the project stands now, I know that, you know, you were doing some virtual events, you know, earlier in April. Um, and then where maybe the story archive that you were speaking about building uh, stands? Um, yeah, so Fifth City Revisited, it was kind of my foray into um, a solo creative process. Um, and it was a project I have been wanting to work on for a very long time. Um, uh, questions around uh, my own family history and um, the lack of access to to, to certain family stories, right? Um, and then also trying to understand um, why certain things seem to be inbred, it like just ingrained in me as, um, as values and like, you know, understanding where some of that came from, but not all of it. And so um, I had a small personal archive of documents that were from my, uh, parents' time as part of uh, something called the Ecumenical Institute, um, which is now the Institute of Cultural Affairs. Um, and um, 
were the, kind of like the engine behind uh, the starting of this kind of fifth city movement in the 60s, where um, a group of folks from the Ecumenical Institute uh, started working with residents to um, think about how to organize, collectively organize to solve their problems, right? To address their challenges as a community. Um, and so they built a structure that was around, like what we might think of as like community block clubs, right? But they had a structure that was built around something called um, guilds, uh, which were kind of these skill sets um, divided, it, you know, dividing people into kind of like where your your skills and talents and interests would take you to support a community and having people kind of work collectively in those guilds to make the changes. But they also um, divided, the, the, the project originally started as, as 16 blocks um, and uh, which was the original fifth city community um, which was Fifth Avenue, uh, Central Park, uh, and Congress, I believe. Um, and then it expanded later, um, to include, uh, Kedzie and I think to Madison. Um, but yeah, they worked in these, you know, in the 16 blocks, they had these smaller, uh, what you know what might be like black, black clubs uh where people will Im initially um get together and just list out the problems and the challenges you know everything from like you know there's trash uh, in the on the street to we need to beautify our spaces or how do we get access to you know um build uh businesses and our black businesses in our community and things like that right and so the that uh, they began to organize and kind of build a, a movement which became the Fifth City um, Human Development Corporation that addressed all of that, affordable housing, uh, businesses. Uh, they built a community center, uh, did a lot of beautification. There were a lot of murals. Um, there's a significant uh, statue that's still, uh, or sculpture that's still in the neighborhood off of um, Fifth Avenue in uh, Holman that is like this Iron Man statue. Um, and that was um, put in the middle of what was like a, you know, in the early 80s became this kind of bustling center square. They had like a shopping center and um, and these black businesses um, and a bunch of renovated rehabbed apartments. Um, there was a preschool, a job training space a community center, which, um, you know, I remember being in that space as like, you know, having my preschool graduation and things like that. And so like the, the uh, exploration through this, this solo performance was about like trying to find and understand that history better, right? Understand these documents my parents had, I got access to um, the, what is really a massive and incredibly organized um, uh, archive that uh, that ICA keeps up, um, and they gave me access to just go through all those things. So you know, I felt like I was really beginning to fill out this picture and understand with the new kind of nuance and complexity the work that they were doing. And again, this kind of process base, like that, it takes time to build and support. Um, community and to create the platforms or mechanisms for folks to collectively problem solve together, right? That doesn't just happen. You have to build structures that will support um, people individually and as uh, a collective, right? To to make those changes. And so, like I just you know the 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 solo work is really about kind of teasing all of that out. Um, in the midst of also teasing out my my own family's um, history and um, the trauma and violence and you know impact of things like drug addiction and um, gang violence and um, health issues and things like that that have all impacted uh, my family on the west side.
you know, and uh, learning, being in conversation with other, um, in particular, black women who have similar stories and also have the similar stories of like, you know, through the, the process of, of migration um, that oftentimes, um, so it's beautiful when, you know, you have folks who, who made that, that migration and they, they um, keep all, all that family history and, and tell it openly. But for some of us, like that, that transition, that migration was really painful and traumatic. And um, in my family, that meant shutting doors. And that meant like, we don't talk about things. And so um, I think that that's been part of um, like working through some of that. And like, why is that part, like that feels like this, a generational thing, right? And like, how do we do, deal with generational trauma within um, our, our black communities, right? Um, and so like, yeah, so like that work, Fifth City Revisited brings all of that into um, conver conversation through performance um, and stories. Uh, used a lot of interviews, found uh, historical archival material, but also did some present interviews with folks and integrated that into the work. Where it is now, um, it was supposed to be performed at the First Church of the Brethren, which is a beautiful um, medium-sized church in um, in that neighborhood, in the Fifth City neighborhood, um, and that the pandemic hit, and we had to kind of shift gears, um, began to do some digital programming. But I just have so much on my plate with Honey Pot and uh, my work in the parks, and so like some of that had to just kind of. And I had a really great team of com uh, community folks who were helping work on that, but had to kind of just slow some of that down. And so where we are now is I'm going to, uh, because, you know, it's great that we've got a vaccine, but we're not going to see, um, you know, any, I think, real shifts until maybe late fall next year, you know, uh, summer or fall. So we've decided to make a film version of the work. Um, and um, so we're in kind of pre-production for that. And that'll happen in early 2021. I'm going to be working with David uh, Weathersby on that project to film it. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, you know, some of it will, most of it will happen in a studio environment, but hope to do some stuff on location in the neighborhood. Uh, so we'll premiere it in the spring as a, as a dance theater film. Um, and then I'm also working with um, Adia Sykes and um, uh, Victoria Sockwell to do an online exhibition. So like I've shared with them a lot of the uh, material that has been um, um, found and researched. And so they're creating an online exhibition that will pair with that dance film um, in the spring. Um, and then we will try to do some more of these kind of closer to that time. What, would, what we would have done this past year if we had been able to do it live was there was gonna be like with the performance, there would have been kind of two weeks at the church of kind of conversations and workshops and uh, local residents and community experts talking about, you know, their visions for a revitalized, thriving West Side and highlighting as well some of the things that are already happening in, in emotion and thinking about how do we leverage more support around um, those folks who are creating those spaces. Um, so I think we'll bring some of that into the digital realm um, in 2021 as a part of that work. Um, and yeah, that, so that, that's where Fifth City Revisited is, um, uh, kind of slow adaptation <laughs> to, to kind of uh, figure out how to continue to work under pandemic conditions. So um, if you're, if you would look at sort of your entire body of work or just, you know, the, the things you have, have engaged in or involved in, and if they hinted at a set of economic values or the values of an economy that you um, think might, might be, um, 
might be more impactful, might be more might might be the one that, that they're touching towards. What would the, those values be that you would like see within it, in an economy that you know your projects speak towards? Mm. Yeah, I think one of the things like when when Honeypot made the move to become a nonprofit, like we didn't do that lightly. Like we, it was actually like, man, this this is the only entity that can hold us right now that you know but it's not it does not fit with our values it is not like the whole idea of like creating a board and uh segmenting into these you know pieces it's like that it's not i think our values are around like how do we how do we operate um horizontally how do we share decision making how do we share um labor how do we share creative vision um and we are continuing, even though we are inhabiting this conventional kind of entity of the 501c3 so that we can get access to certain kinds of resources that we didn't have access to as a fiscally sponsored project, we are still very much trying to um, build our organization in a way that, that honors that kind of collective work um, and responsibility, right, and the shared leadership and a decision making um so i think those are those matter to me <laughs> at the core uh and i think it, you know for the folks who are part of honeypot performance that continues to be um really important to everyone who is involved is that we are acknowledging the wisdom and the gifts of all who share in the work um and so that we can we collectively make the vision together and rely on that community expertise to get stronger. Um, so I think those are the things that I gravitate towards as I, you know, as I see, um, I am encouraged in this moment by what I see happening at the neighborhood level that I think that there are lots of smaller um, coalitions that are um, a combination of like individuals with fire in the, the gut and belly to do things and um, communities that are rallying together to say, you know, we deserve these things. We deserve access to these resources and this kind of quality of life and are trying to push to make those things happen. Um, so, I th yeah, so I think that th those values are important um, if, if we are to move forward and move forward in a way that supports um, the collective right um and that everybody gets to eat and speak and grow and thrive um and then i, I want i guess i want to mention that like uh honeypot has has um uh gotten this great opportunity um we know it will be a challenge as well to work citywide in the next couple years uh, with the Department of Planning and DCASE on something that um, is called We Will Chicago. So it'll be announced pretty soon that we're like uh, working with them as like the, the public um, uh, lead public engagement artists. And so we'll be, um, I think, in the spirit of like our, what all, all of what I talked about and the ways that we work already we are really excited to like build a core of artists and organizers who are gonna um, work with us to um, think through like designing some you know uh, experiences and experiments and what we will hope will be like you know plans that can actually parts of them be, be actualized right in the, in the near future that are around that community resilience and uh, rebuilding and growth for the benefit of those communities who live, you know, and the residents who live there, right? Um, so I think that that is an exciting thing that's coming up that will take the things that we have done on a smaller scale um, uh, with our projects to date and map that out into community um, citywide processes of um, engaging communities. So that's something to look forward to. And actually something I probably <laughs> will be reaching out to you to see if we can get you involved in. Uh, yeah, I certainly look forward to it, you know, and there actually were a few other things before that in the previous question that, you know, I connected with one resonating with this notion of um, 
the migration, um, the, 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 what's held within people within the sort of the post great migration. Um, I know I shared within cooperation for liberation, you know, during one of our conversations while we, we're currently reading Freedom Farmers um, by Dr. Monica White. And I was sharing the story of my grandpa, Robert, who, um, you know, I don't have much history beyond him on that side of the family tree because when he came north, um, you know, he told my father, I don't want to talk about that. You know, Noxaby County, Mississippi, I don't want to talk about it. I don't, it wasn't a great time. I went to the army to get away and then I left that, that place forever. Um, so, you know, that, that was certainly something that resonated with me. But one other thing that I, I wanted to maybe, you know, touch upon is, um, you know, with uh, Fannie Lou Hamer and the Freedom Farm Cooperative, um, you know, we talked in Co-op in Co for Lib about this idea that um, black institutions have had the challenge that they are never really either just charitable or just commercial. They are institutions that are always needing to meet need and always needing to generate maybe other types of revenue to survive. So I, I don't know if you have any sort of thoughts about that idea that connect. Yeah, I mean, we've, again, we've been thinking as we like, you know, again, we move, we move slow to become a nonprofit because we knew that, you know, that that was going to be um, a challenge in terms of like this revenue building, you know, but we also got to a point where our projects were becoming so scaled up and ambitious and layered that we needed access to more resources than we could currently tap. Um, and so I think that we've, in, in the process of doing that, making that transition, um, have thought about a lot, it, have been thinking a lot about carefully about like what what is revenue, um, what are streams of revenue that we would want to build that um, connect with our values, right? And so that has been, that led us I think to this kind of deep um, look at like, well, how do we make our works? It's not like, you know, conventional, um, or, or we're not teaching technique of, you know, the body in terms of like a, a dance technique or language, right? What we're creating are these kind of design experiences that invite people to go deeper into their stories as both individuals and collective communities. And I think what, as we are now looking back at the body of work, we're seeing these patterns um, and that there is something rich in there. And like, if we're going to have to, you know, build revenue streams and like that, that's what we're investing in is like, how do we continue to build these processes that we can um, maybe outsource out in some ways and, and kind of build revenue around that, but then constantly find ways to then share what we're learning back with other parts of, you know, communities. Um, so I, yeah, I think that's one way I would address that question. Yeah, um, and then there's um, there's another thread, you know, that we can pull in from the previous conversation, which is really about the um, Ecumenical Institute um, stepping back from Fifth City Project. Uh, currently, uh, ICA has announced that they're stepping back from Chicago Sustainable Legal Leaders Network. Um, you know, it's not like a big secret, so it's not news made here. But, um, you know, so the conversation really feels prescient. Um, but one of the things that we talk, to, talk about in Co-op for Lib um, when we talk about our mutual aid work or our cooperative work, and we express, you know, what our values are um, in terms of how this work should live on, um, I, I talk about like I'm really interested in leaving freestanding infrastructure. I don't want to prop up the tent forever, but you know if I if people know how to kind of construct it and structure it and hold it, then you know it's okay if I depart you know from a project at any point. So um, you know it, it, that 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 sounds like what you you you've expressed there. You know, so did you want to speak more on that at all? Yeah, I love that. I'm mean, Tucker. We gotta collaborate. We really need to collaborate. <laughs> Uh, you know, yeah, I think that we're very much thinking about everything that we're, we build or create, we're trying to figure out like, how do we, how do we build the pathway so that I could put it in a book or some other format or whatever, that you could then take it and, and do it, do it yourself, you know, like we want to cr create um, 
things that are resources to people and communities to um, do the things that they want to do. Like it's not, we're not giving you something that is like, you know, create that thing. We're creating a process that hopefully allows you to think about whatever it is you want to build and design and create with others that we're creating um, the templates or the, the mapping documents that allow you to do those, to do that thing, to do the thing you want to do and imagine um, instead of imagining it for you. Not, not down with that. Cause I, yeah. <laughs> So then, yeah, I want to open the space now just if you have a closing thought on either reflecting on Nia, you know, um, on our collective vocation um, or, you know, just kind of, you know, telling people how they can tap into the ongoing projects, the horizon for 2021. Um, these are closing thoughts, you know, given to you to use as you, you, you please. Nia is the principal today, is it not? Yeah, purpose. Um, so that's funny because that just brings me back to memory in, in college. I was part of a, a group of um, uh, black women who and other women of color who ended up creating their own sorority um, instead of like going with AKAs or Delta uh, or any of the others. We decided to create our sorority, sorority and called it Nia. <laughs> so that's a good reminder on this day that we can create our own things with purpose. Uh, and that is what I think um, Honey Pot is committed to doing. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, we want, we will have, very soon we will have information about our part of this We Will Chicago process. And so we will be uh, hiring artists and organizers and a, a administrative support team to help make the whole project go. But it's something that will go beyond just 2021. Um, and so um, we invite folks to you know check out our page on um, uh, Facebook or Instagram for um, information about that as we head into the new year and get involved. Uh, we really want to have a, a committed group of artists and organizers working with us on this project because we feel like it's the first time that from my knowledge the city has um, done a comprehensive kind of uh, master plan where they are, um, they did one in the 60s but this one they plan to try to implement parts of it, the ways that they are um, starting the engagement are, um, mm, what am I trying to say here? They, they uh, the forecast looks bright, like that they are acknowledging that it will be, uh, it will take time, that it will have to be process-based, that they will have to wait to get community feedback to make decisions about doing things. And they seem to be, folding that time in over the course of the process. So we're excited about that and the fact that they are uh, at the front end acknowledging the um, the things that need to be redressed about the way that uh, the city has um, not necessarily supported um, some of our black and brown communities, especially on the south and west side and how to redress that. So we, um, I feel like that is uh, something that we are very excited about being part of that that challenge and accountability of holding the city to do do the, the, the necessary work if we wanna think about building a future thrive in Chicago that represents everybody. Um, I also wanna note that the Chicago Black Social Culture Map Project uh, has been a slow evolution, but is uh, growing um, in amazing ways. We just got um, Mellon uh, Foundation funding from uh, an archive, uh, archive um, community archive program they have called Public Knowledge. And so we'll have support over the next two years to again bring more uh, folks on. Uh, so thinking about being able to pay folks to do more work uh, that's around our um, collective Black heritage and building those archives and ways to, um, again, help folks uh, um, gather the tools to be able to tell their own stories. So that's something that uh, we'll be building out in 2021 and we'll be 
revisiting um, a work that we did 10 years ago called Ladies Ring Shout. That process will start in the fall or winter of 2021, and we will be looking to work with the a broader uh, community cast of Black women, intergenerational, that will take apart that work from 10 years ago that was really kind of like this patchwork um, um, experience of like what are quality of life issues for Black women? And like, you know, what are the threats and challenges and where do we find our joys and uh, documenting all of that through stories um, and uh, research. And so we look forward to like taking that that work apart um, with other black women and rebuilding it into something that represents us in 2021 and moving forward. Absolutely, you know, well, um, we uh, definitely appreciate, you know, um, sharing of the work. Um, there's, uh, you know, folks, please go ahead and uh, follow um, Fifth City Revisited Honey Pot Performance. Um, get into those works on Facebook, um, get into, you know, um, the, the, the other spaces on social media. If you just want to do a shout to any of your social media handles, I know, you know, I always forget mine, but, you know, just. <laughs> I'm not good at that. <laughs> we just we just brought somebody. Or I actually, I, that's where I need training and support. Um, so just know that you can look for Honey Pot Performance on Facebook. And I believe it's Honey Pot Chicago on Instagram. Um, and uh, we, we have a website, honeypotperformance.org, which will be updated soon um, with information about We Will Chicago and the 2021 projects, um, the Chicago Black Social Culture Map Archive uh, is being updated and will be on that site. And we'll be actually launching a new um, site in early 2021 that uh, gives access to all of the stuff we've collected up to this point. Um, and stories that have been gathered through even the virtual programs we did this past year. So, yep. Uh, so get into all of those uh, locations, folks. Um, touch upon all of the work that that uh, that Mayday is connected to. Um, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with you. Um, you know, it's 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 been we 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 covered a lot of terrain. You know, there was a lot of those other questions that were brought in and some new terrain. So I'm I'm excited to kind of you know mix this one down. Um, and you know, I, I look forward to you know collaborating, connecting, working with you further in the future. For sure, Tech, and we reaching out to you. <laughs> yeah, bring it on. All right. So be well, you know, um, I, you know, look forward to connecting again. And yes, we will circle back around uh, on another day. Yes. Thank you. All right. All right, folks, um, that has been the special edition episode of the Ujima Hour, um, our NIA uh, episode. Um, so, yes, I, I, I hope you had an opportunity to go back and, you know, look at least at the, the acceptable audio from the previous interview. Um, if you did not, uh, it is there on the Colonet Collaborative Facebook page. Um, so please check that out. Um, you know, 2021, this is going podcast, you know, so um, make sure that you check out the Colonut Collaborative Facebook page, uh, not Facebook page, but the website, colonutcollab.org, K-O-L-A-N-U-T-C-O-L-L-A-B.org. Um, there is a podcast link on that page where you can see the trailer for the pod, or you can hear the trailer for the podcast. You can't see that podcast, it's audio, um, but you can hear the trailer for the podcast, uh, you can prepare your ears, you know, for what's what's to come. Um, we will release the the first uh, episode of that podcast in uh, January of uh, 2021, and then from there, you know, um, expect monthly drops on the podcast. Expect the ongoing monthly video interviews um, on the Facebook page, and um, yeah, you know, we'll we'll keep going. We'll you know un un until until there is no one left to interview, um, you will see a monthly interview on the Ujama Hour with uh, someone who is working in the black social and solidarity economy, someone who is organizing in a way that expands the boundaries of community, expands the boundaries of the collective, expands our notions of economy, uh, you know, to all of the different ways that we meet our social, cultural, and economic needs, right? Um, all of the ways that we meet our needs and all of the ways that we are, are in relationship with the people inside of our community, inside of the places where we live and work. 
Um, so uh, please, you know, uh, continue to check in on the Ujima Hour. Uh, our next episode um, in January, uh, again, will be with uh, Erica Allen of um, Urban Growers Collective and Green Era Sustainability Partners. Um, so that is going to be up on January 11th. So um, follow the, the Colon Art Collaborative Facebook page for more information there or so that you can see when those um, uh, live events are posted. Uh, and until then, folks, I bid you peace. Uh, I hope that you are well. Um, take care. Be in cooperation. Be in collective. Build the collective vocation. Build community. Uh, facilitate community. Um, all of those things. And we'll see you back here in January. <laughs>